So when we did put Practice Protect in, we were able to downgrade our cybersecurity because it is so much safer than lots of different passwords. And then, of course, transition our employees to work from home just in a second. It was great. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I am your host, Michael Palmer, and today's show is going to be a great one. Our guest is the Director of Bookkeeping Relief Business Services based in Australia, and she's also a pure bookkeeping licensee, also a winner of several awards in the industry in Australia. Julie Watson, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to have you, and it's always a pleasure to hear from people who are from around the globe, and uh, we've had a few guests on the show from Australia, but not for for some time now, so it'll be, uh, I think, refreshing to get new, fresh insights into how things are going for you and your business uh, in Australia. Sure. Great. Great. Now, before we get into all of that, Julie, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your career journey leading up to this point? Yeah, so I was doing bookkeeping. I sort of fell into bookkeeping through IT and had been doing it for about 10 years when they changed the legislation in Australia and you needed to become a registered BAS agent and have a qualification, a tertiary qualification. So I was CFO at the time and I um, went back and did an accounting diploma through TAFE here in Australia, got my accounting diploma. And then when I finished that, I I wanted to resign from my job and start the business properly as a registered BAS agent. So I had been doing it part-time for many, many years. And uh, the problem was when I did it part-time on my own or, or when I had done it prior to working as a CFO, there were times where it would peak and trough. I wasn't coping with the workload around BAS time. And then it would get really quiet. I wasn't sure how to get new clients. So there was a lot I didn't know, but the technique I had was really good. So I found Pure Bookkeeping, that was five years ago. And I realized that if I was going to leave my full-time job and go out and do this as a business, I wanted to do it right. I didn't want to stuff it up and spend 10 years wasting a lot of money. So I found Pure Bookkeeping system and I really went into it with a lot of questions and I did a lot of due diligence and managed to make sure that it was going to work for me. When I did that, I took it on and then I just applied it. I did everything that it said and then I took a leap. I left my job and I just took a leap, applied everything in the system and went out and did it full time as a business. So I think that that was the best decision I ever made, just doing it that way and not sort of trying it and dipping my toe in and then taking it back and doing it my way. I just thought I'll just apply everything that Debbie has done and just trust her because I'd already worked out that she was trustworthy and the program looked like it was legitimate and then do everything it said and then hope for the best and I did. And from that I grew pretty quickly really. My first two years were just really quick growth. Things were working amazingly I was putting on lots of staff and growing really fast, which was fantastic. And then I hit a snag in my in my business with with staffing, with getting the right staff to stay. So, but it's been just the journey, having pure bookkeeping there, teaching me the workings of it, giving me the confidence in myself, and then also the procedures that I thought I already had a great technique. I realized we're not as great as they could be. So the procedures, the templates and the systems were just fantastic for me. So now five years later through pure bookkeeping, I've been doing bookkeeping for about 15 years, 
it's now myself with two other full-timers. We've got three full-timers and things are just ticking over really nicely now. Wow. Mm. Uh, what a story and, and always refreshing to hear the success come for those that, that work for it. And also it came with some snags with, with, with the hiring. What, how did you figure out how to solve that? You're now at three full time and, and, uh, and some part time. How did you solve the snags of staffing? Yeah. Well, when I realized I'd gone through so many staff here in Australia, I decided I'd bring them in and did the pure bookkeeping method and sort of brought them in first before I would go remotely. Tried all of the different prop situations. I took some remote staff on that didn't really work out. Started to think of something about me because either they were leaving or I was sacking them. And we even used the HR procedure. So I'm sure we got better staff than we would have if we hadn't done it. But I realised I just wasn't making it here. So I I engaged in a mentor. So Katrina Arsman was my mentor and I I went to Debbie and said, who do you recommend? Katrina helped me a lot, helped me to identify staff and the weaknesses and things that I cannot train quickly. But at the end of the day, I was at a, a trade show and I was having a conversation with a lady who had outsourced to the Philippines. And I said, I'll never do that. I'll keep the business in Australia. I wouldn't do that. But it got to a point where I had an ad on advertising for a position for about six months. I didn't get a single applicant that was worthy of interviewing at the time. So I think, you know, the level of bookkeeper in Australia had increased really quickly. The compliance and complexity of what we needed to do had increased so fast that the labour force hadn't really caught up. And I I really couldn't get anybody to even do the job. So at that point, I looked into outsourcing. And then I went through a company in the Philippines who bring workers in and hire workers and look after them. And my two full-timers are now working in the Philippines for me remotely. And that has been for the last 18 months. And that has really solved all my problems with the labor force. Wow, that's remarkable. And and so this comp- tell say, t- tell us a little bit about that company and how it works. Like it, I'm sure many of our listeners have considered this, have, ta- have struggled with, just like you have with offshore and outsourcing. What does that experience go like in your business now? Mm, it was like everything else. It was a learning curve. Um, being better prepared is always the best thing. So. I had done similar to what the listeners might be doing and done a lot of research and asked a lot of people what their experience was. I went through a company called Toa Global and they have big offices in the Philippines where they do the hiring. So they basically say, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for an accountant because even though we're bookkeepers, the level of understanding and training over in the Philippines is different. So I hired accountants and they would then ask you your hiring criteria and they would put the ad out. They would get a short list, having done all of the research, then give you the short list. So from that, I interviewed about five or six of them on Zoom. And from that interview, then I was given an English test result, um, accounting test result and various test results that they did internally. And then I would hire from that. So I pay TOA Global and then TOA Global pay the employees in the local payroll system. And and the best thing is that they work for me full time. So TOA Global won't allow you to take on a casual or a part timer. So they actually become your employee. They don't work for anyone else. And that's really important. And you have to take them on full time, which is also really important because at the time, I didn't want to invest in a full timer as a risky, I thought it was a bit risky. I thought, oh, I don't really want to want a part-timer for now, but I had to jump in and do full-time. And the first one I got was just incredible. It took probably, I think, about six months to get her up to speed, but that's exactly what it was like with an Australian employee. And from there, I found a massive difference between the Filipinos and the Australians. So they're just the work ethic and they have a really great culture in that they try to please. They don't have this kind of I know it all attitude. So when they do make a mistake, they're willing to learn and uh, and they're very honest. I've just found they've just been amazing. They probably cost me half as much 
of what I would pay for an Australian employee. But that was never my factor. It was never the deciding factor because at the end of the day, they probably cost you about a quarter of the time. So they're a little slower. So in the end, you're paying maybe 75% of a wage, but they're great. And I really thought that my Australian clients wouldn't cope with being dealing with a Filipino, but I have my Filipino staff on client-facing work. Now, most people don't do that. They're a little risky. They're a little worried about putting their offshores, dealing with their clients in case they lose the local clients. But I had no choice. I just had too much work. So I put them on the clients and they all have their own dedicated clients. In the beginning, I would say this is the new you know, new team member that you have. Her name's Melissa and I didn't tell them that they were in the Philippines because there was a bit of a stigma here. But Over time, I started to tell them now, when I take on a first client, I'll say, I'll I'll start you off, I'll do the rescue, and you'll end up with one of my team members, and they could be in the Philippines. And I'm finding people are going, great, fine, Um, no one minds. So it's just working beautifully. I trust them. They do a great job. And even my Filipinos are doing basses, and they're doing rescues, and they're contacting clients. They're fantastic. It's remarkable. Uh, we've had Nick Sinclair on the podcast uh, back episode 174 for any of our listeners. And it's it's great to hear that was uh, several months back that we talked to Nick. And, and now here we have a guest on that's using the service and, and you're having a tremendous time with it. It's fantastic to hear. Yeah, that's great that you've had Nick on. Yeah, they're fantastic, really. They're a great company. When something goes wrong in the Philippines, like there might be an earthquake or something like this, uh, lockdown was announced at 7 o'clock at night on the spot, no warning. Toa were fantastic. They just said all of the employees in the Philippines, if you can get to Toa, we'll let you take the computer home and work from home. And they've been so supportive. We allowed our team members to work from home. We also put Practice Protect in, which is a fantastic product and I highly recommend it. Having known back then when we implemented Practice Protect that it would mean so much now in COVID-19, I would have done it earlier, but we implemented Practice Protect because of the TOA staff and that made it amazingly easy. So when they did pick up their computer and take it home, it had to work from home, everything was on there and it was all secure anyway. So we've just had a great experience with Toa. They've been brilliant and very flexible and just promised everything and delivered what they promised, which was really nice because it's a bit of a risk when you outsource. You don't quite know what you're going to get and you're dealing with a country you've never dealt with before. So it was, it was one that paid off for me. That's fantastic. And tell us a little bit about Practice Protect. We haven't discussed that on the show yet. Let's give our listener a bit of an understanding of what that solution is. Oh, it's absolutely brilliant solution. What it is, is at the moment where we're all in the cloud and all our apps, you, you would know, we have a huge stack of apps that we're using and we have to log into each one of them separately and we have to keep those passwords and all of that. It's not only insecure to have lots of logins and to be logging in and out of apps all the time. But it's very time consuming. So what Practice Protect does is you set up all your apps within one app called Practice Protect. So all your apps, meaning all your accounting packages, your emails, Dropbox, SurveyMonkey, everything that you have a login for, it's got to be cloud, goes into your your practice protect. So in the morning when you log into your computer, you just log in once, which is your practice protect login. And then within there, you can open all the icons. And then those icons open with no passwords. They're all encrypted in the background. So your team member over in the Philippines doesn't have to know any passwords. And the good thing is if, if you do lose a team member and you have to let them go, you straight away come in and just disable them in Practice Protect and they can never log in again. But what I found was great about it was not just the security of that, it was just the time saving. I think it's probably saved me about an hour a day if we think about it in all the logging in and out that we're doing of things, particularly with bank accounts and all of that. We put all our bank accounts through Practice Protect 
and then you just click on an icon, it just opens straight into the bank account for any client. So it's it's a really good thing and it's very safe and secure. So when we did put Practice Protect in, we were able to downgrade our cybersecurity because it is so much safer than lots of different passwords. And then, of course, transition our employees to work from home just in a second. It was great. Wow. That is, that's a very interesting solution. And I've heard about I've heard pra- practice protect for people talking about practice protect more so from uh, my connections with with uh, the Australian community, but never heard exactly what it was. And it makes complete sense. And I imagine it will be something many of our listeners will be looking into, and we'll we'll start to look into whether or not it's applicable for North American bookkeepers or or wh- where they're at with that. Yeah, it should be actually because you can geo lock. So if I travel to Canada, I can, I can ge- I'm currently locked into Australia, so I can log in from anywhere in Australia, but I can now transfer that to Canada. And I've done that in different countries. If I travel, I just lock myself. I change the geo settings. So my Filipinos can only lock in, log in from the Philippines. So it is a very worldwide system. It's good. So you would, you're, it's, by the sounds of it, just in this conversation, your business is quite virtual. Oh, 100%. So yeah. you, you've migrated your business to be 100% virtual. And did you do that before working with Toa Group or Global or were were you on your way there? How did that evolve? I think it generally happened with Toa Global because I didn't feel comfortable with having my bookkeepers working remotely prior to that. I wanted them in the office with me. I do have an office actually. So at that office was bigger than I need. And now I sublet a lot of the space that I use it because it, for me, it's easier to work outside the home. But it generally happened with Toa Global because, yeah, I don't need them in the office, but it is virtual. Yeah. And we don't have any clients on site at all. So the only time I do need to speak to somebody is when potentially a new client wants to pop in and visit and meet me face to face. Other than that, everything's virtual. It's remarkable. And you know, that that is the, the, the future, right? Even though you you have your business operating virtually, you could do it from anywhere. You choose to do it from an office because yes, working from home as we're all doing in the world right now, uh, it has its pros and cons. So having a place to do your business, it's uh, it's somewhere to go and, and keep work where work is, but you have choice now. Yes, exactly. I I do appreciate having the office. Um, What the office does for me is it allows me to work nine to five and switch off completely. And that's what I do. I don't work from home. So I work in the, I drive into the office only 10 minutes from my house. I work nine to five. I, you know, sometimes a little bit later, sometimes earlier, I leave the office and I leave my work at the office. So for me, it was very good to have that space. And I do recommend that even if you're subletting an office from somebody else, if you find that you need that separation, it's also helpful for meetings and Skype meetings and things like that, that you don't have to control the noise. But yes, it, that's right. It means then that I can travel or I can move and easily just do exactly what I'm doing, keep practice protect login from anywhere so I can log in from any browser anywhere with it. And, and keep working and there won't be any interruption. And also the clients know now that we're remote, 100% remote, and they're quite okay with that as well. That's so amazing. That's amazing. What, what were some hurdles moving to a virtual-based business? I don't think I've really had any roadblocks there apart from the staffing. It's not been an issue for me at all. I mean, we really did go paperless very early only because we saw the benefit in that. We use Receipt Bank. It was a natural progression, really. I think the systems have changed a lot. And pure bookkeeping lends, I think pure bookkeeping lends itself to business owners who are progressive anyway. And I was very determined to make sure that I was as up to date with the latest technology and the latest systems, the latest legislation as I could be, because I didn't want to be just another bookkeeper. I wanted to be the bookkeeper that knows the things that the other bookkeepers don't know. (laughs) So that lends itself to becoming 
remote and flexible paperless and, you know, technologically savvy anyway. And then it was just a natural progression. I didn't really find that there were any hurdles in that for me, I don't think. I still do attend a pure bookkeeping mastermind group. So I meet prior to the COVID. We were all meeting once a month or once a quarter to have that physical connection. But, you know, I, I haven't found any roadblocks. I don't find it isolating. I think because I'm t- dealing with a lot of clients, I do phone call. I do ring a lot of my clients a lot. I try to maintain that or they ring me. And I do find that some of the clients who like to pick up the phone and call tend to not be able to call my Filipinos. I can do it on Skype. They tend to still call me. So I do get, I pick up a lot of those phone calls. Mm. Yeah. It's remarkable. In terms of growing your business, we've talked a lot about the infrastructure that you're using, the workflow and, and how your business operates. How about on the client acquisition side? How has that been for you? Yeah, that's been real interesting. I would love to see that on a curve. One thing I did do is early on, I worked out my break-even point. I worked out my, and also with Katrina, I worked out how many clients I was getting every year and how many I was losing and things like that. So in the beginning, the first two years, it was a really huge growth and I, I just got so many clients and I was out there marketing a lot. You know, I was telling everybody what I did. It, I got a lot of clients. It was really good. But then I noticed in year two, three and four, a lot of clients were leaving and I realized that was my staffing issues. So when you have staffing changes, it affects your client base. Sometimes you've got a, a staff member who just isn't doing a good enough job and they'll muck up that client for you and you lose that client. So I I lost a lot of clients. But now things are starting to pick up again, and it's a different reason. So I found that although initially there was a lot of marketing, a lot of, you know, me getting out there, networking meetings and things like that, I don't do those anymore. Now what I do is I change my focus. I'm not in the desperation mode. I've got enough clients. And so my focus has changed. And now instead of thinking, I need more clients, oh, when people ring me, or oh, book you in tomorrow, let's have a chat. Instead of doing that, I now try to educate the, the population a lot more. I'm out there trying to educate the business community. So I do interviews and I do um, take videos and publish them on my Facebook page and I try to edit my website a lot. And I get out there just to help the community because I ha- can do that. And I'm finding that has built my credibility out there. So now I'm getting people that are ringing me saying, oh, hi, you know, I found you online. I researched you. I looked for, I looked through everything else and we want you. And rather than saying, what are your rates and blah, 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 they've already picked me from my social presence and my website and obviously the credibility that I've built up over the years. So I like that. Pure bookkeeping gave me that perspective. So not it's not all about me and it's not all about my money or my business. It's really about also putting back into the community. And I think when you do that and you have this outward focus to helping others and not always about making yourself look great, people pick that up and they realise you must be good at what you do and then they come on board. So now we don't advertise at all and now we're trying to now filter out the inquiries, which is really good. We don't want to grow again too fast and have to put on more Australians, but that might happen. Yeah, and it's going well. It's steady and, and picking up better, more ideal clients than we ever did before. It's uh, amazing to hear and and just uh, listening to your journey, how you're you're at this stage. I mean, it's textbook in terms of what what everyone in the, the community should be thinking about and focusing on. But you do what you do when you're at that stage, and you know you've gone through a lot of of, of those stages, and and you've built a really great business. But what rings true for me is, you know, the, the mission statement of Debbie Roberts, Peter Cook, who founded Peer Bookkeeping, was to help great bookkeepers grow their business. And you're a great bookkeeper and you have the passion to help 
people, not just grow a business and make money. You're, you're in it to help your clients. And those are the people that Debbie and Peter wanted to help. And it's refreshing always to see that and hear that on this show. And we talk a lot about small business and, and uh, how important it is. And so, yeah, I always, I'm always delighted when I hear people who are passionate about educating small business owners and, and truly in their heart wanting to help them. So it's, uh, it's great. It's a great industry to be in and great community. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's what attracted me to the pure bookkeeping system is the integrity and and the confidence they had and and I needed that. I needed I thought I was okay as a bookkeeper. I needed to really believe that I was a good bookkeeper and um and that was worth something and that I could put my rates up because when I did start with pure bookkeeping my rates were terribly low and I remember going to my first mastermind meeting and introducing myself and they said, tell me about your business. And I just started and what do you charge? And I thought, oh, you're not supposed to ask me that. Like, that's really rude. And then I told them and they're like, what? You shouldn't be charging that. You like should be charging $20 an hour more. This is back when we were doing the hourly rates. I said, I couldn't do that. That's crazy. I couldn't charge that. And then they spent all this time telling me why I could charge that. And why do you think you're not worth that? And can you do this? And do you know that? And I took a leap and put my rates up $20 an hour and was really shocked that it worked um, and applied that. And I tell people that now constantly, like sometimes bookkeepers will ring me and say, oh, somebody said to ring you because, you know, you might be able to help me. I don't know if I should continue. What do I do? And I always say that to them. What are your rates? You're too low. Put them up. It matters a lot in your head what you value your business at. And if your rates are really low or you're charging yourself out too low, people will, you will start to feel that you're worth not enough or not as much as the next bookkeeper. But in fact, if you realize you're worth a lot more than that, you've got a lot of education, a lot of experience, you're actually pretty good. And and if a business owner is in trouble, and they come to you, you're going to be able to help them. If you can and you're confident that you can, well, you should be charging for that. And if you do charge for that and you realise your value in the business world, other people will see the same value in you and it comes out. That's something Pure Bookkeeping taught me. It comes out in what you say. It comes out in how you present yourself. You don't even have to say, I'm worth that kind of money. And we're not the cheapest and we're not the most expensive. We're probably up near the top because we do a really good service. But, in, and like I learned in Pure Bookkeeping, if somebody rings me and says, how much do you charge? I generally say, if you're shopping on price, probably not, we're not the best people for you. And you can really quickly find out if they're looking for quality or price. And it matters. So, so great to hear. And uh, I'm sure for many listening, it'll be refreshing to hear this message. And it is remarkable how what can happen when you surround yourself with supportive people uh, and people that that have been there and have walked the walk that you want to walk. You know, it's it's logically you probably knew that you could you you should be charging more. You know, maybe you didn't logically know that, but you you probably had some inkling of it, and yet. It's not just the logic that's going to get you. There's so many components to being able to have the courage to 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 do something like that. And so it takes a community to grow a business, right? It's just like it takes a community to raise to raise children. Lovely story. I absolutely love that. And I think the value, I think the industry, I think bookkeepers are some of the most undervalued people in the business community. And so what what that what what gets me excited is about how much opportunity there is in the marketplace for people like yourself and and the community that you operate inside of to to shine. And it's just a matter of being aware that you're great and you have lots to offer to to businesses and that what you offer is incredibly valuable. And we're seeing that more now. This is I, I'm saying with, with the COVID-19 crisis, bookkeepers are stepping up and they're the ones that business owners are calling. 
and and getting help and guidance. And so that's one of the silver linings inside all of this is that you you have the now the the you have the stage, you have the spotlight and you have the ability to do the great work that you do. Yeah, I do agree with that. And I agree that they were very we are very undervalued as a business, but I, I do see that stepping up like you said, Michael, and I see that it's stepping up very slowly that the public are getting educated on what a bookkeeper does. It is slow, but it's definitely happening. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited that we can just confidently say, okay, you want to rescue, this is the rate. And most people would have a choke on the hourly rate for a rescue, but now they're a little better about it. Recently about, it was about four weeks before all the COVID-19 stuff hit, we decided we had to put our rates up again, just an hourly, an annual rate review. So I sent out a letter to everybody who needed a rate increase and and all our clients are on packages now, they're not on hourly rates. So we put the rates up and and the, the email that I sent out, it was really well worded. I have to tell you about it because afterwards I got Two clients, like nobody said, oh, that's not fair, I'm not paying it. No, not one person complained about their rate going up. But two of my clients emailed me to thank me for putting their rates up. And um, I had this email where I sent it out, good morning, hi, blah, blah, blah. Just want to let you know what's happened over the last 12 months. And I put in a bit of a summary, like, of all the massive changes in the industry that we've had to keep up with that we've done for them in the last 12 months, the compliance changes and things like that, you would have noticed that STP came in and you would have noticed that da-da-da-da-da, this is what we did. Um, And after that, now you were on this rate, um, your last rate increase was here. From this date in a month, your new rate is going to be this. And then after that, I wrote, what's planned for the next 12 months. So things that I knew were coming up in zero or things that I knew were coming up in the government. And I said, okay, over the next 12 months, what you can look forward to is some enhancements here. And this is likely to change and we're going to be on top of the new legislation that's coming out. Have a great day kind of thing. But because I did that and explained it so well, the two of the clients that I had thanked me because they felt like the increase was not enough. (laughs) Wow. So it was really interesting exercise that it's all about perception and how you demonstrate what you do. And if there's a value in what you do and you can demonstrate it, people are just very happy to pay for the service. It's remarkable. You know, it, it, uh, there's another piece to, to Debbie's mission, and that was to transform the bookkeeping industry. That's the, the whole, to transform the bookkeeping industry by helping great bookkeepers grow their business. And you really are, I mean, I think Debbie listening to this podcast will be uh, very happy to see that her, her vision, her mission for the industry is, is fulfilling in people like yourself because you are raising up the industry by the work that you do and, and, and uh, other people in the industry get to benefit from that. You're, you're leveling up the game and helping business owners and they're, they're saying, look, you're not charging us enough and that's a testament to the work that you do. So, so, so great to see and uh, so interesting. You know, you're, you're right around the other side of the planet it for where I am right now, and yet your world and the things that you're doing and what's happening there are very similar to, to here in North America, and it's very refreshing to hear. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting, isn't it, to talk to somebody from another country and find out that you're doing, have the same similar issues and the same challenges and successes. It is. It is. And I know through, I mean, for myself, being connected to uh, Pure Bookkeeping in, in North America and working closely with, with Debbie and, and also Katrina uh, and Peter uh, Cook, is the, the we have really looked at the industry and, we, and more and more all the time as one global industry and that we're all in this together. And whilst there's unique differences between the countries, the, the, the aim is the same, right? We're in it to help small business owners with their, their businesses, bookkeepers, what bookkeepers are doing in every, in every country. And so there's so much we can leverage between all the countries. And with that, we've seen 
an incredible increase in, in the value that we're able to deliver. And, and so it's, it's through this podcast that we bring together new ideas and fresh ideas from, from other countries. And it's been, uh, don't want to say it's globalization, but it's certainly collaboration globally. And it's been, uh, it's been pretty fun doing it. Sounds great. Julie, this has been absolutely fantastic. I can see why you are the award winner of several accounting uh, and industry awards. You're, you're, you're very laid back. You're very well experienced in the work that you do. And I just hear the generosity that you have for your clients and uh, probably your staff. And so it's been a real pleasure uh, having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate that. It's a real blessing to be on the show and, and to be on a podcast in North America is fantastic. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And I, I have a sneaking suspicion we'll have you back to tell us how things are going on in, in your business and uh, get us an update at some point. That would be fantastic. I'd love to. Beautiful. And with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper podcast to learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources. You can go to thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.